Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will get started in just another minute. I see a bunch of folks hopping on the webinar. So hopefully y'all can see us and hear us okay. Um, if you're having any issues, try to type them in the questions box. Uh, like I said, we'll get started in just a minute. All right, it is a little bit afternoon, so let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us for our third installment of What I Wish I Knew When I Was a Young Professional, hosted by your YPs from the Texas chapter of the Solid Waste Association of North America. I'm Sarah Nichols, I'm the program director for Keep Texas Beautiful, and I've been involved with our Texwana YP group for a few years now. I'm also the Sustainable Materials Management Young Professional Liaison for SWANA National. We first started this webinar series in 2019 with feedback from our chapter YPs that they wanted more professional development training opportunities. That webinar was so popular that we brought it back as a session at the TechSWANA conference that year and now as another webinar. Each session has featured a moderated discussion with three solid waste professionals who have been in the industry for a while now, giving our attendees the opportunity to learn from their stories and experiences. Even better, it lets us get the chance to know these leaders a little bit better and helps put a face behind uh, a name that we've maybe seen at conferences and in emails. Today's webinar will follow the same format, an introduction from our group about YP activities, followed by a moderated discussion with the three panelists with time for questions and answers at the end. Before we get started with the meat of the webinar, I want to go over some quick housekeeping so we can try to keep everything running smoothly and on time. You should all be muted through the system, but just go ahead and mute yourself on your end just to make sure there isn't any sound interference. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, you can type them in the questions box and we will answer them at the end. Um, that questions box is in your control panel. If you're having any issues connecting to the sound on your computer, you can look for the audio section of your control panel to find a phone number you can dial in on. And if you're having other technical issues, we found that most of them can be fixed by just logging out and logging back into the webinar. Now I'll go ahead and cover the agenda. Let's see if I can uh, get my slides going. There we go. Uh, the agenda for the webinar, we'll start by going over what a YP is and how to get involved in the Mentor Match program and other YP programs. And then I'll introduce our panelists and we'll begin our moderated discussion. At the end, you'll have some time to ask questions to our lovely panelists and then we'll be finished. And with that, I'll go ahead and introduce Sonia Samir with Park Hill out of Frisco, Texas, who will go over some information about what a YP is and how to get involved. Sonia, take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm Sonia Samir. I work as a solid waste engineer with Park Hill in their Frisco office. I'm also um, actively in, uh, involved with TechSwana YP has been for a couple of years. Um, I'm the Swana YP Region 3 uh, Chapter Liazo, and I'm also part of the um, Swana YP um, Steering Committee. So um, before we begin, on the Swana Young Professionals and how you can be involved and take all the benefits. I'd like to introduce uh, Caitlin Sholsky. Uh, you cannot see her on the screen, but she's the Texas YP Chair. Um, you have, if you have any questions, you want to be more involved in the chapter and you want to know about the, what's going on and updates, please reach out to her. You can find her information on the Texwana website as well. Uh, I'd like to also extend my thank you or our thank you uh, to Tiana. Uh, she recently retired from the YP. She, uh, she used to be the Texwana YP chair. Now she's part of the Texwana YP board. But she's been uh, always the biggest help 
um, in any of the YP networking events or any YP events we have been organized in the past. Um, so now getting into what a SWANA young professional is um, or who is the young professional, it's a, a defined by an age limit of 35. So if you're 35 years or younger, you can take the benefits of registering as a SWANA young professional. Um, the couple of benefits that comes with it is a reduced price membership. So if you're a um, student professional, then you can be a free um, registration, so you don't have to pay for the membership at all. But if you are a young professional who's working in the field uh, for the first, second, and third year, there are reduced price rates to register. So uh, what do you get when you register as a SWANA um, YP member? Um, there are a couple of things um, you can be involved. Two of the major parts is like a mentor match, so you can find a mentor, and I'll get into more detail into the next slide, how you can do that. Um, there are several online resources, like the webinars that we organize um, and um, other information. You can take the in, uh, uh, help from the YP forum if you have any questions. And also the biggest part, like uh, the networking sessions that we all look forward to in the conferences. To getting into more details on the mentor match, um, if you've never heard of it, it's uh, it's a relationship building for like six months. Um, so if you want to find a mentor to guide you through your professional career, you can uh, look for with the narrowing search with your focus if that matches in inside this one as a registry. And um, it used to be before it used to be like any time you can log in and find a mentor for you. And now it's structured a little bit differently. So there's going to be only two time open enrollment starting one in the spring session in February and another is going to be in the fall session. That's going to be in September. Uh, each time that's uh, the, this time a session is limited only for the mentees. Mentor can be enrolled anytime they want. So you can enroll both as a mentor and a mentee at the same time. Um, once you log in and try uh, searching your mentor, and you can continue that relationship through SWANA for six months. Um, you are more than welcome to continue more than six months if you want. And um, I have had mentors in the past, and I would say it's not only about like the like an academic relationship. You get to continue that further and uh, look beyond, um, uh, have a new perspective or a different perspective and look beyond your career to grow. So that's all, and um, there are always open positions and uh, volunteering opportunities through SWANA and TechSwanas. Um, if you're interested, you can go to TechSwanas website and SWANA's website, uh, look for open positions right now. And I know we all are busy, um, but we try to, and it's not a huge time commitment, uh, depending on which role you're looking for um, or just a networking session, however, that fits your uh, growth. Thank Thanks. you, Sarah. Uh, I'll get back to you and let you continue with the panel discussion. Yeah, and Sonia, before you get off of the the camera, I guess, um, we do have a question for you. So just want to verify, this is for those age 35 and younger, right? Yes, This um, the mentor match, if you want to be a mentee, that's going to be uh, below the age limit. But if you want to be a mentor, um, you don't have to be 35 years or younger. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. We have an awesome YP team here in Texas. Um, we've done some really fun uh, virtual happy hours now in the time of COVID, some great webinars and some good uh, networking sessions when we're able to be in person. So definitely uh, encourage y'all to get involved in your YP groups. There's just a lot to learn and also you get to make um, friendships with awesome people from all over your region. All right. So with that, I will go ahead and move along to the kind of meat of the webinar, which is the moderated discussion with our lovely, wonderful panelists. Um, these are the three panelists. I'll go ahead and introduce you all with quick um, bios now, all at one time. So our first panelist that we have up is Shirlene Sitton. She is the uh, Environmental Services Division Director at the City of Santa Fe, New Mexico. She oversees trash and recycling programs, sustainability, keep Santa Fe beautiful, whoop whoop, uh, and graffiti abatement. She's worked in Santa Fe for five years, 
but she is a Texan. Uh, she worked in uh, municipal government for more than 20 years, many of those years in Texas for the city of Denton. She shepherded the sustainable Santa Fe 25 year plan to adoption. She is also the president of the New Mexico SWANA Roadrunner chapter um, and programs within her divisions have won two national SWANA silver awards, which is awesome. Um, and then I did hound all of our panelists to send me pictures of them when they were a YP. So um, that is her picture of her when she was a YP working at the colony, I believe. Okay. Our next panelist is Josephine Valencia. She works for the city of San Antonio and has since 2010. She has more than 20 years of solid waste and recycling experience in four states and DC. She implemented the mandatory multifamily recycling um, and a citywide food scrap and yard debris program in San Antonio. Fun fact, she lives at a former zoo, which is pretty cool. Um, and then she is a SWANA member and also teaches some of the SWANA certification courses um, on collection systems, transfer station management, and recycling systems. And that is her picture of her when she was a YP. Okay, and last but certainly not least is Holly Holder. Uh, he is the principal of Park Hill and director of environmental there, where he oversees Texas and New Mexico's sustainable solid waste engineering services from permitting to construction. Uh, he has more than 30 years of solid waste experience with facilities as small as 20 tons per day to facilities as large as 1,250 tons per day. And his notable, notable affiliations and awards include being a Texwana board member. Um, he is on the MISRAC, which is the most fun acronym in Texas, um, but that's TCQ Solid Waste Council. He's the past president of the Caprock branch um, of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and he was named the Engineer of the Year in 2011. He was also my neighbor <laughs> when I was growing up, so we realized that um, a couple of years ago at a conference, uh, so it's kind of fun to um, connect on that level. <laughs> All right, so those are our wonderful panelists. I think doing some quick math, there's what, more than 70 years of combined solid waste experience. So I think we have a lot to learn from y'all. So thank you again so much for sharing your expertise and your time with us today. So we will go ahead and dive into it. Um, Shirlene, do you want to start by sharing how you actually got into the solid waste industry? Was it kind of random? I was very random when it came to you. <laughs> and then once you start speaking trash and whatnot it's kind of hard to get out yeah it, it is um I, I don't even think you know this story and that was a great um uh, that was a great introduction uh you know i i did uh study <coughs> environmental science renewable natural resource conservation uh at texas a and m whoop I'm, I'm i'm imagining the whoops out there um <laughs> oh no <laughs> um but um i worked at a restaurant a funky little restaurant and the uh, was local, a uh, little taqueria, and the owners were, you know, kind of old hippies. And um, way back then, in the late 80s and early 90s, the, the the restaurant had the only recycling program in College Station, and we recycled everything. And let, I want to point out, the restaurant was in a house, so it was very small. That the, the the space was very confined, and it was very popular. I mean, a lot of people came through. And we recycled everything, glass, aluminum cans, cardboard, you know, the, the box board that the you know, beer, we served a lot of beer, of course, it was College Station. Um, and, and there was no single stream recycling then, so everything was separated. And um, right, I ended up working in restaurants for quite a while before I ended up in um, government and solid waste. But right from the beginning, I, I learned how to recycle. And I didn't know that that was setting the, you know, the platform for a future career. Fast forwarding ahead um, a few years uh, to my first municipal job, I, I saw an, uh, a, a listing for recycling coordinator for City of the Colony, and I, I read over it, and all of my restaurant experience, I, I could apply, and of course, and with my environmental, um, with my environmental degree, and I went in, and I just talked about knowing how to recycle, and I, I landed the job. 
Um, I won't, there's two stories because I left and then it sucked me back in after grad school. But um, yeah, it, it, it was just kind of random. And um, I tried to get out and go to grad school. And after grad school, uh, I got sucked right back in. It, 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 it was a great job and um, it, it has been all these years. That's funny. I didn't know that story. So uh, it's funny how that happens where you kind of get in and you can't get out. Uh, what about you, Holly? Did you have a similar experience or what was your experience like? Well, it's totally different, you know, as a consulting civil engineer. I came, uh, when I left Houston, uh, Katie, as you know, uh, I moved back to Lubbock in the uh, late spring of 89. And uh, Park Hill has always worn a lot of hats. And one of those hats was solid waste management. Well, the engineer that had always done that work had moved on. And we had one of our clients that wanted to permit a new landfill. And no one in the office wanted to touch it because that was before subtitle D had been um, issued by the EPA. And everybody knew it was coming at that time and nobody wanted to learn the new rules. So I was in a, just in a meeting and somebody said, well, does anybody want to do this for Brownfield? I went, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Not knowing what it was going to involve. And, you know, once I got into it, I soon found that everything I had studied in engineering school, except for structural, was involved in the world of solid waste engineering. And so I really became, uh, uh, it became one of my first loves. I liked it because it had a little of everything. And so that was in uh, late 1989 and early 1990. And then from there, of course, we went into the subtitle D and it's just been something I've, I've really grown to, uh, to love and care about is uh, the sustainable way of how we handle our trash. So that's kind of it. Thanks, Holly. And then Josephine, I'm curious about your story and I'm wondering if you can talk to a little bit, um, you know, being a woman, especially at that point, entering a male dominated industry, what that was like as well. Okay. So I grew up in New York City and back in the 80s when I was 18 and looking for my first job, New York was really old school civil, civil service for young professionals. This is probably a foreign concept, but for an entry level municipal job in New York, you took a test. It didn't matter if you wanted to be a painter, a, a garbage driver, a fireman, you took a test, you got a score and your name goes on a list. And then you wait for your number to be called. There's no interviews for entry level positions back then. You just waited for your number. And the rite of passage was you're 18 years old, you're looking for a job, you take every test you can imagine because unlike the SAT, they don't offer the test every year. For example, to be the garbage truck driver, that test is only offered every three years. Even, to, even today, it's only offered every, every, every few years. So I took every test imaginable, including the police academy and a whole bunch of other places. And guess what? The first time my number came up was for a solid waste job. You know, I had no interest in solid waste. My plan was I'm going to college part time. I'm going to get a real job in an office, never smell garbage again. That was 1990. So it was a long time ago. But so, yes, I fell in. I, you know, my plan was not a solid waste career. And yes, it was, it was really difficult. I was, I was the only woman. Th I was the only woman there. And I was the only, not only the only woman in a, in a job, I was the only woman in a physical labor type of job. But for me, it was a very simple solution. I grew up in extreme poverty and I needed income. I needed income to help me pay for my college degree. So that was the driving force for me. It was not a, at the time, it was certainly not a passion for solid waste. It was a passion for a paycheck. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, Shirlene, can you speak to being a woman in a male dominated industry? Or was your experience different? Well, you know, um, it, maybe it's not as much uh, this way now, but definitely during the 90s and the 2000s, you know, recycling uh, coordinators, you know, were, are, were predominantly women. And that, that was kind of the, the pathway into solid waste um, for women. And for a lot of women, they couldn't make it out of that. And maybe they didn't want to. It's, a, you know, it's a, certainly a great and fulfilling job. Um, but it, you know, it was it was a little bit hard to 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 rise up out of it. You know, even though I think I did a great job as a recycling manager for many years, um, it I can give a piece of advice here. Um, 
it, you know, just be sure that you are learning and understanding operations as well. And I, um, I had some, uh, I had both the outreach side of recycling and the op, um, some of the operations. And having that operations was helped me help me reach, you know, being a director now. Yeah. But it's not easy. It's not easy to, uh, uh, you know, certainly observed. It's not easy for um, women uh, to to get out of that recycling coordinator track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Holly, can you speak to anything that was particularly challenging for you when you uh, first started out in engineering and working on landfills and whatnot? Well, the, the, the mass amount of regulations that uh, control the industry, for one, you know, you're, you, it's a lot, it's like drinking water out of the fire hose, you know, when you first pick it up. Uh, you're you're having to make sure that all your bases are covered because something you do on one end affects something on the other end. And if you don't know the full extent of the, of the regulatory package, then you might miss something in between that's really that could be a, a vital part of the overall design. And so much of uh, what we do in consulting is uh, is written. Um, my uh, writing skills at the time were, you know, I never really put a lot of emphasis in uh, English and grammar. Hated it uh, growing up, but I quickly learned if I was going to be successful at this, I had to be able to write clearly and concisely. I always tell uh, these engineers that come in and interview is like, you know, I can get any engineer to do an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, that's second nature to engineers. But it's being able to articulate that in a written document so that not only the technical reviewer understands it, but this is going to go out to the general public. And so you have to make it to where, um, you know, someone that's concerned about the facility can pick that document up and read it and understand it as well. And that's probably the biggest challenge that I think that a lot of engineers face is uh, they really can't write. And in the solid waste world, like I said, where so much of what you do is written, that is a, a really an important uh, task to learn to, to, to be able to do, so. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because I had maybe the opposite experience when I was looking for my first you know, big job out of college. I was just looking for any job. It was 2010, so still kind of post-recession slash hard to find a job. And I had a journalism degree, so even harder to find a journalism job at that time. And uh, I was living in Houston and just randomly got a call from um, who ended up being my boss uh, at the State of Texas Re Alliance for Recycling, the state recycling organization here in Texas. Um, and she was like, can you get to Austin for an interview? And what she was drawn to was the fact that I could write and I could communicate well. So she ended up hiring me for uh, a communications role. And, and that was when I did not get, couldn't get sucked out of this industry from there. Um, but at the same time, you know, I thought Excel spreadsheets were just a way to make fancy lists. So <laughs> I had to learn you know, how to do all these other things like you know, eventually manage a budget. And, um, you know, I, I had those opportunities because I said yes to this just random thing that I never thought I would do, which was work in solid waste and recycling. So um, I think saying yes and just kind of uh, developing those skills that you may just not naturally have um, is, is a very important key for people who are entering the industry. Okay, so that brings us to kind of the, the question that is at the heart of this webinar is, you know, what do you wish you knew when you were a young professional? What do you wish someone had told you? Um, you know, what were your biggest lessons learned that uh, maybe you can save some of the people on this webinar a headache or two? Um, Josephine, I'll start with you. I think one of the things that, um, that I wish I knew was when you are, interviewing for a job and you're in it and if you're lucky enough to have more than one job option to look at the stability of the company or the government that you're applying for and not just your own compensation you know i was at a point where i i got my college degree and i'm looking for you know my professional type of job and i was lucky enough that i had two job offers and 
which one did I take? I took the one that paid me the most money, which at the time seemed like the smart thing to do. And what I didn't know at the time was even though they were paying me a lot of money, this was a local government that was broke. So from a, you know, from a comfort standpoint, from a, sta from a comfort standpoint, you know, this was a company that could, you know, could barely afford to buy, buy paper clips, you know, forget about going to a conference or professional development or stuff like that. It was like, yeah, I have a great salary, but the organization itself was in financial, di in financial difficulties. So that's something I wish I had known at the time that it's not just about how much I'm getting paid and what I'm doing, but how is the organization overall doing? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because being able to have those resources to learn and to grow, I think is key to um, being able to eventually move on into bigger uh, footsteps. Uh, Holly, what about you? Any lessons learned or also, I mean- Oh, right now, yeah, I mean, a lot of lessons learned and learned through the school of hard knocks. And, you know, I think that's one thing is, uh, you know, you got to run your own race. Uh, you've got to be able to get out there and uh, and and learn from your mistakes. You were, everybody's going to make mistakes, but you have to learn from them and not repeat them. And that's the biggest thing in the consulting world is uh, you know you've you've got to be on your A game because of the, the competition that's out there for for your clients for the work, and so you've got to be able to learn to step up and when you make a mistake, own it. It's yours, and uh, and come up with a solution. You know, it's one thing to make an error. It's another thing to make an error and go, I don't know. I don't know what to do. You know, when you realize what you've done, then uh, step up and come up with a, a hard and fast solution of how to, to get get it solved. And that's, that's what I think I learned the hard way is uh, solving those problems and, and keeping the projects moving forward. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Uh, Shirlene, uh, any advice you want to give to the YPs on this call that you wish you do? Or um, I know you work with a number of YPs, so what do you tell them about what you wish you knew when you were a YP? Well, you know, as I mentioned, I um, my uh, all my education is in environmental science and. And um, I was always very passionate, very passionate about saving the planet. And, um, you know, that first job we mentioned, um, when I left it, a lot of the things that I put in place just immediately unraveled. Um, and I would say that, you know, first of all, understand that everybody doesn't share your passion, even if you think it's very logical <laughs> and very important. And, um, you know, not everything you do is going to last. But uh, don't take that personally, but you do need to work to make sure you're not a lone wolf. You know, share your passion in ways that um, people can understand uh, why, you know, why the things that you put in place are important. Make sure that you've cultivated um, some relationships uh, and, and, and people who will take on um, the, the responsibilities, you know, when, when you move on, if you move on. Um, and. <clears throat> And, and find ways to make sure that the, the changes you make are, are lasting. And even if they aren't, know that what you did did touch people and that people will remember and just have faith in that. Yeah, thanks, Charlene. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide, which is about mentors. Um, and I think it's great because I have been very fortunate to have a number of mentors throughout my career. Um, I was kind of thrust into a role that um, was super exciting, but also super overwhelming pretty early on in my career and having uh, people around me to just talk to and try to learn from it was really, really, really important for me. Um, you know, all of the people on this webinar right now have uh, provided great advice and, um, you know, been very instrumental to my career, especially Charlene, because she was my board chair for a while. So um, mentors have been very important for me. Obviously, they're a big part of what the YP group does through the Mentor Match program. Um, so I definitely encourage everyone to get involved in that. Um, so I want to learn a little bit more about 
your mentors. Uh, who were your mentors when you got started in this industry and you know throughout? Do you still have mentors? Um, how did they become your mentor and how did that impact your career? Uh, Shirlene, do you want to start? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so many. Um, but, uh, you know, specific to when I first started, um, my boss at that first job uh, was a woman and, and she understood the challenges, you know, that were faced. And um, she and, a, and um, a friend who was also a, a council person in a nearby city and worked for um, the, the trash company that we've contracted with, um, they both they both really they they helped me in those formative years. Um, a, another mentor I'd love to mention uh, was was just a colleague. I uh, I served on a, a board of the Texas Trails Network long ago, and and I had a friend Bud Melton. I don't know if anyone here ever knew him. Um, he was a just a community activist in the Dallas area, and uh, he just he he really supplied a lot of mentorship to me as well. And one of the one of the things I remember that's always that I've always remembered that he said to me was, "If you want something done, ask a busy person." Um, and and that's been some of the the best advice I've ever gotten. <laughs> but I've I have so many people to so many people to thank. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Charlene. Um, Josephine, what about you? Can you tell us about an impactful mentor in your career? Um, and I'd be curious, how do you kind of form that mentor-mentee relationship? And maybe even y'all can speak from uh, the perspective of being a mentor and have you had mentees approach you, uh, young professionals approach you to mentor them? Um, how do you form those relationships? So I think today there's a lot more focus on formal mentorship programs, so such as the, the SWANA, tech, SWANA Mentor Program. Um, going up in my career, I've certainly had a lot of mentors, but I wouldn't necessarily call them an, a mentor. We never had a conversation saying, oh, will you be my mentor and teach me all about solid weights? I think you will find mentors from your colleagues, from your supervisor, and even in places where you may not expect. Let's say you have an awful supervisor that you're thinking, this is the, definitely the last person I was as a mentor. You can still learn a lot from him. You can learn that this is not what I want to be. This is not the relationship that I want to foster with my employees. So I would say you have to be open yourself to mentorship and learning opportunities everywhere you go. Sometimes you may approach someone and say, oh, will you be my mentor? And they're like, no, I don't want to do that. But if you approach it in a different manner, if it's actually if it's someone you work with or work for and, and, and it's a more casual, hey, can you show me how to use this Excel spreadsheet? Oh, I really like that presentation. Can you tell me a little bit how you prepared for it? You don't need to have a long, formal, defined mentorship program to learn things from people around you. Thanks, Josephine. Yeah, I think that's really great advice that it doesn't necessarily have to have a label that you can learn through all sorts of experiences, both good and bad. Holly, what would you add to that? Well, I agree with Josephine in that uh, I didn't ever have a mentor. Mentor was not a thing when I was in my early 20s and even early 30s, you know, it just was never talked about. In fact, I always think about my first job. Um, you know, I was working for men that were in their mid 50s at that time. And they had all been World War II vets, had all grown up in the Depression, and had had a totally different uh, background in how they were raised and reared. And uh, they were tough. Um, there was no coddling. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you had to put your, as they say, your big boy pants on every day you went into work because they, they, when they asked a question, they wanted an answer. And, uh, and and there was very little margin or room for error in there. They a lot, a couple of them were sergeants. One survived Okinawa. I had another one that went into uh, the Ardennes on December the fifth. Ten days later, he's fighting in the Battle of the Bulge. And so they were at they they just had a totally different mindset than I did. You know, I grew up with the college. Hey, you know, we went. Uh, had a few, kind of like a Shirley, there was a lot of beer involved, and 
and they did too, but they were under under fire for a lot of time. So really there wasn't anything they could do to me in their eyes that was worse than what they suffered when they were my age. But as far as uh, somebody that actually said something to me, is my grandfather, who again was a total different generation. He was he was quite a bit older, um, born in the, he was born in 1885. And he told me when I got out of college, he said, you're going to go work for someone that doesn't know you. You have to make them a hand. In other words, you have to do your job because they're paying you and they expect you to do your job. And that's always stuck with me. And as far as my career, I've, I've had a lot of mentors that were not formal mentors, but I observed and, and listened and, uh, and picked up on good habits. Uh, picked up on things I didn't want to become, and so that's that's really how I kind of worked through, the, you know, my whole career. Thanks, Holly. Um, Shirley, and I'm wondering if you can speak to a little bit uh, the like I asked Jos jo Josephine, how do you form that mentor mentee relationship, or um, if you did want to form more of a relationship with, or if someone wanted to of a relationship with you as a mentor, like what would you look for? How would you go about doing that? Oh boy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like Josephine, I, I've never had a really a formal, a formal mentor. Um, I, I really have just tried to take away the best and worst from uh, especially the supervisors or colleagues that I've worked with. Like, I really want to be like that. And I don't want to be like that. Um, but I, I think I probably, um, myself and my personality, it just um, kind of, I, I guess I'm kind of a natural teacher. So I like, I, I really like, uh, you know, working with people, um, no matter where they, they are in their, their career. And I try to learn from people and um, I'm, I'm always trying to, to teach. So I, I guess to answer your question, I would say, look for, if, if you want a formal relationship, um, for me, I would look for, you know, a natural teacher or um, the one who's just doing something the way I want it, that I want to emulate. Like, I wish I were more like that. That That's what I would look for. Thanks, Charlene. And, and for me, I, I mentor through Textwana. I also mentor through the through San Antonio's. We have our own internal mentorship program. And what I have found to be the most successful mentorship relationships for me are the ones where me and my mentee have some sort of connection outside of work. That you can't be talking about work all the time. Relationship, relationships are really what drive the business, whether it's solid waste or restaurants. Building one-on-one -on -one relationships with someone really makes things better. And if you have something that you can chat about, whether it's dogs or wine or the Olympics, something that you have in common, I think helps uh, forge that relationship and makes it easier to build trust and talk about difficult work to work related situations. Yes, I love all of those things, dogs and wine and the Olympics. So I'm always happy to talk about all of them. <laughs> so thank you all. I think that's a really good point, Josephine. And also part of why we wanna do these webinars is because it really does put a personality behind um, maybe faces that people have seen before or email addresses or maybe they've seen you speak at conference um, but we're really getting to know you through these kind of webinars um, and I just want to remind everyone that if you do have questions please do type them in the questions box um, we're about halfway through the slide so we'll just keep going um, Holly what are you the most proud of in your career what's been the most rewarding accomplishment so far well, you know, really, I think uh, what I really enjoy about consulting engineering is taking a really what amounts to a blank sheet of paper and creating a project that you actually go into the field and and uh, can observe its construction. And so that's, I think, I always, every project I do, I feel is a professional accomplishment because of that. It's just, I think it is it, 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 satisfies a creative urge that I have of uh, being able to take uh, an idea 
and put it on paper, put it on paper in such a way that someone can understand it so it can be constructed and then operated. And so I think that's that's really a, just a continual thing. It's hard for me to, to pick one individual project because I'm basically like a, a proud parent. You know, you're proud of all your kids. And all of my projects in some way or another are like my children to me. And so I'm, I'm proud of each and, each and every one of them uh, in some, some respect, even those that didn't go well. You know, they're still... There's still things that I learned out of them and uh, were able to implement on, on later projects. So I think that's that's what I enjoy about engineering is uh, it gives me that. And I like to build things. And so that, that satisfies that desire as well as the creative instinct in me and being able to, again, come up with an idea, put it on a piece of paper, and then watch it actually built and used by, by people. So. Thanks, Holly. Um, Josephine, do you have something that was uh, that you're most proud of in your career so far? There is, and it's not something that's really visible. It's not an award or it's not a new building. It's not a new uh, public accomplishment. I think what I'm most proud of is having forged relationships and continued relationships with frontline employees. One of the things also related to advice to young professionals that I see here you know, in our organization is that there is a big disconnect between young folks and experienced veterans, especially those who do the actual work, but our drivers versus our young college educated professionals. There's such a huge disconnect between those two groups that I have folks who, who are young and enthusiastic and they have wonderful ideas and I love to hear them, but some of their but some of these folks have never talked to a driver. They've never even sat in a garbage truck. And there's being able to bring these groups together to kind of say, maybe what you're, you know, maybe what you're proposing really isn't that, that optimal or, or, or workable. I'll give you an example. You know, I have a couple of young people who are working on, on, on a few mobile apps for us. And their ideas are great. But one of their ideas, you know, was adding something like 10 seconds to every address that had to be looked at. And they're like, it's only 10 seconds. Yeah, but 10 seconds when you're doing, you know, a thousand inspections a day, 10, you know, that's a thousand times you need to click on an extra button. So these little details are add a lot to the workload and trying to bring different groups together to, to, to make the work better for everyone. That's really what I'm the most proud of. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Josephine. And, and Shirley, you might be able to uh, kind of piggyback on that a little bit and talk about, you know, because you're also involved in operations, but you've been involved in a lot, a lot of different sides of the solid waste industry. You know, how do you help bridge that um, kind of disconnect between people who are really boots on the ground and then people who are maybe working in the office a little bit more? Well, that's a great question because really what I was going to say very much follows in line with what what Josephine was talking about. Um, you know, throughout my career, a, a large portion of it has been about public outreach, public education, special events, um, doing things like that. And and I'm that's what I'm good at. I'm comfortable doing that. It's fun. Um, the other parts are harder. And, um, you know, when I came into this position, I, I, I came into a department with uh, a fleet that was unimaginably old and decrepit and, and um, we, the, there had been to buy uh, CNG trucks, but we didn't have a, a CNG station. We had just had a one um, fast fill and it wasn't very fast. And, and so the lives of the frontline workers were hard. And I'm not saying it's that they're, they're not still hard, they are. But um, to me, getting things that make doing that job easier is absolutely most rewarding. And, and I found ways, you know, we've been aggressively updating the fleet, um, working on improving um, our mechanic shop. And um, we, you know, we opened a new CNG station uh, a year ago that's a, a overnight slow fill so the guys can, and girl, we have women driver too. Um, you know, they can just hook up at night and then come in in the, in the morning and, um, it's, you know, uh, it, it just, it, being able to do their job is a lot easier. And so for me, those are the things I'm really proudest of. Um, my, my management philosophy is 
hire the right person for the job, give them the tools they need to do the job, and then let them do their job. And so, but to me, my job is finding the tools for everyone else. And that's that's what I'm the most proud of or makes me feel the best. Thanks, Charlene. I think all of y'all had uh, really good advice throughout that whole um, question. So I love the way that y'all answered that. All right, so the next question, how can you, well, how, how do you work smarter and how can we work smarter? Um, and then, you know, kind of in that question, how important has continuing education and professional development been for y'all in your career? Um, I and mean, obviously, you know, all of us are involved in some capacity with SWANA or uh, state chapters of SWANA, but are there any groups besides SWANA that you found to be helpful for your professional growth? If so, what are those groups that um, folks can also get involved in? Uh, Josephine? For me, I would say Toastmasters. I think, it, I think any organization that helps you build your communication skills, whether they're verbal or written, is, is key. The, I've noticed the higher I've gotten in my career, the less nitty gritty solid waste work I do and the more communications work that I do. I almost feel like I could be running in a restaurant or an airport now because as an assistant director, I don't have much to do with the day-to-day -day operations of garbage collection. You know, I don't drive the truck, you know, I don't supervise I don't supervise the landfill. I manage people. And to manage people you need excellent communication skills. Yeah, I think Toastmasters is actually a great uh, piece of advice, something that I need to be better about, as I say, uh, all the time. But I did take a Toastmasters class for a little bit, and it was helped me get over my fear of public speaking because I never did any public speaking in college at all. Um, I was a writer. And so when I got into my career, I was just like, I don't like talking in front of people, but now I have to do it all the time. And having those opportunities through Toastmasters and other groups was really key. Um, Holly, what about you? Well, you mentioned Toastmasters, and I did that for a while. But, you know, I think uh, it's very important to get out of your comfort zone. And uh, I'm a member of Rotary International and to here in Lubbock, and that's made up of just local business people in the in the city and it, it you get to meet with a total different uh, group that don't really understand solid waste and it gives you an opportunity to educate them but it gives you an opportunity to learn from them about their business and how things that uh, you do impact them and vice versa uh, i think my involvement in uh, cspe has been Vital. It's, it's a Texas Society of Professional Engineers, which is a part of the NSPE. And as an engineer, you, you need to be around other engineers. And that's what uh, NSPE and TSPE does, is that it brings together electrical, mechanical, civil. And you, you talk about things that you don't normally get a chance to visit on when you're at a solid waste conference. I think SWAN involvement is very important because that's where you're your industry networking comes from. But I think if you're just limiting yourself to to one organization, you're uh, you're really hurting your career and what you can be because you're not exposing yourself to other other ideas that uh, you wouldn't get if you were just strictly stuck in, in one group. Education has always been important to me and continuing education, not just because as an engineer we're required to to do that every year, but it's important, I think, as an engineer to continue to learn because things evolve and change, you know, yearly. And I think attending seminars and attending conferences is, is important to to learn as much as you can about what's going on and what's changing. So I, th I think those are things, but I just think getting yourself out there and, and getting involved in other groups outside of the one group that you that you work in, you're just you're just here, I think you need to be out there and be involved in other aspects, business associations and things like that. It just makes you a better, well-rounded person. Yeah, thank you, Holly. And Shirlene, I know you are someone who is involved with many, many different things. Um, 
how has that helped you kind of work smarter? And do you have any groups that you would recommend people start to get involved with? Well, um, first of all, I, I can't echo the importance uh, enough of um, public speaking and uh, and writing, as, as Holly mentioned earlier, um, as a as a person, as an employer, uh, it's it's very frustrating that uh, people can't write. And um, if that's a skill that you're not really great in, um, do you know do whatever you need to get better at that, as well as as public speaking. Um, I came, I kind of came from a speech and drama background, so I I I had I had a bit of that and some confidence in that area, um, and that that helped me tremendously i mean that again going back to that first job that those are some of the things that helped me land that so those are that's great advice another organization i would add um, if it's applicable to your position is your local chamber of commerce that is uh if, if you have a good chamber of commerce and they have um, a leadership program which there's there's local leadership programs regional leadership programs so it'll be called like Leadership Denton, which I did go through. Um, getting getting involved in the chamber, if you're if you're serving the business community, right, as a as a solid delivering solid waste services, that's a good way for you to get to know the business community and and what their needs are. And if you're uh, you know wanting to uh, move up and and make contacts, uh, networking, all of that kind of stuff, a leadership program, if you can get involved in that which will tend to be a several month program with meetings and, and they have like a municipal day and a state government day, uh, education day, and you'll meet leaders from all around your community or your region. Uh, and I, I just think I, I went through Leadership Denton and that was a fantastic program. So if you, if you have that available to you, um, look at that. Great, thanks Charlene. Um, so we have one more kind of professional oriented question and then a fun question after that. And again, a reminder to type questions if you do have them in the questions box. We have just one or two questions, so hopefully we'll have time for um, those at the end. But, you know, we have you are all director level positions to municipal government uh, positions and then a consultant. Uh, if we have folks on this call that want to follow in your footsteps and eventually be a director of some sort, um, what advice do you have for them to be able to kind of work their way up from maybe a coordinator role to a director position? Um, how do they, yeah, how did you do it and how, how should they maybe do it? I'll start with uh, Josephine. <laughs> so how many of you have heard the phrase, you know, follow your passion? I actually think that's kind of terrible advice, but I have a I have a corollary to that, and that's take your passion with you. So using you, Sarah, as an example, you know, you have a journalism degree, and I'm sure working for a recycling company was not at all what you were thinking about. But if you had the passion for writing, you were able to channel that into a, a writing type job in a different industry. So, you know, wh wherever your passion may, may be, I would say you have to be open and flexible to say, where in this industry can I find somewhere where I can apply that? You know, solid waste is a huge industry. You know, we have everyone from accountants to, you know, graphic artists to, yes, the people who drive the truck. So whatever it is you do, focus on that and do it and do it well. I was talking to one of my managers earlier, you know, knowing that I was going to ask this question, get asked this question, and I asked him, you know, what was, what, what put you on your path? And this is a, you know, a frontline level manager. And he had told me this, he had told me the story that when he had started out, he was complaining about to to his boss about how he got to work early and left late because you know his route was really big, and the advice he got was if you don't do it, someone else will. And and that's true. And I've had, you know even though that's not my story, I I have had similar experiences in in my career that the the work is hard, but if you if you want to advance, whether it's in solid waste or any other industry, you have to work hard. You have to you have to put something in it. If you can't just expect to say, oh yeah, overnight, you know, I'm going to become the director next week. It, you know, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of effort, and you only only you can decide if if that's the effort you want to put in. So that's my advice. Uh, what about you, Charlene? 
Well, it's telling it's telling about how our experiences are similar in solid waste. I had a lot of I had a lot of notes for myself, very similar to what Josephine said. Um, it, you know, solid waste is a field where you can do everything from being a graphic artist to driving a truck. And um, I don't drive a truck, but uh, there are there are so many different things I might do within a day and, and always have in this field. And I love what she said about take your passion with you. I mean, I studied to be a restoration ecologist. Um, but I took my passion for saving the planet into recycling and conserving natural resources. So um, that's that's all really good stuff. If if you're if you're looking to move up and follow that path, I think one of the things I would say is, you know what? Not everybody's going to like you. That was one of my lessons um, that I, I think I would want to share, and it it hurts. <laughs> why, why don't they like me? Um, it's just natural and uh, it's going to happen, but whether you, there will be people who love you and you will have your allies, but if you are a supervisor, if you're looking to work your way up, you have to treat everybody with respect, whether they like you or not, um, and, and build that respectful uh, reputation for yourself. And when you have a chance to hire people, once you've, you know, once, once you've determined uh, competencies and qualifications, look for those people who are not the same as you. I've hired a lot of people and um, I, I know that we have a tendency, we all of us have a tendency to uh, gravitate towards people who are like us. And, um, you, you're going to go a, a long way and you're going to help a lot of people if you step out of your comfort zone a little and um, look look to hire people who are different from you. And when you're building a team, you what you want to put together is a team of people with complementary skills, but the same goals. Thanks, Shirlene. I think that's really great advice. Um, and, and Holly, speaking from the private industry side, do you have any advice on how to kind of work your way up to that director level position? Well, it, it takes a, I wouldn't say it takes a lifetime, but it takes a while. It's like, you know, when you buy a new house and you want a, you want a yard that looks like it's been there for 40 years, but it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it happens over a period of time. And, you have to develop relationships and you have to foster those and, and uh, continue to, to work in improving yourself and improving, you know, your, your daily aspect. And you just, you just learn. It's just a, it's a, I had a guy tell me one time that was about to retire. He was like, you know, I'm finally at a point where I can look at a project and say, do this, this, and this. And I don't even have to think about it because I've done it so many times. I know it. And he said, you know, I wish I knew that 30 years ago. But you're not that way. You, We all have to learn. And uh, sometimes, you know, those lessons are painful. And sometimes those lessons are, are wonderful. But it, it just takes a lifetime. And you have to have patience and just continue to do it if you like it. You know, if, you, if you're not happy. In that job, you really need to find something you're happy in. I was like Josephine said, I think a while ago, took her first job because it paid the most. I did the same thing. And for my first five years, I was miserable. And finally, I had to get out of there, and I went to made a completely different direction in the engineering field, and that's where I've been ever since. And it's just, uh, just be patient in your career. It doesn't happen overnight. It, it takes time and patience and you'll get there yeah i think that's uh great advice one of my favorite phrases that i come back to time and time again not just for work but also just life in general is just trust the process um trust yeah. that it's happening the way that it needs to happen and you're making good decisions so um, okay, so we have one one question. I think what they're asking about, and I'm asking this now before the fun question because we have just a few minutes, but um, where are some good places to maybe look for jobs if you're looking to work at maybe the state or the national level? Um, do y'all have any advice on that? 
Well, I think, you know, Indeed and government jobs and also LinkedIn. I don't, I'm not sure if this answers your question entirely, uh, Sarah, but um, I, I think the, the way to find a job is through, a lot of times is just um, through people you know. So what are the pieces of advice I always give people is volunteer. Volunteer for organizations that are doing the kinds of things that interest you, uh, that you want to do. Um, and I look for that when I'm hiring people. Do you have any volunteer experience? You know, do, are, do you believe in this enough, you know, to, to try to work for it? And so you can make great connections that way. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Charlene. A lot of times the jobs end up materializing through the people that you know. So um, getting involved in organizations like SWANA and volunteering on boards, I think is a great way to form that relationship. Okay, so I went I, I went to the last slide. Um, in closing, I just want like quick 30 second answers from each of y'all on if you won the lottery, um, and we don't want y'all to be altruistic in this uh, question. So don't tell me that you're gonna donate all the money to charity. Um, what would you buy or where would you go? Shirlene, I'll start with you. Um, I would buy a family compound. Uh, I would buy a big enough property with a house and some little houses, or I would build the little houses. I have two grown children in Texas, three stepchildren. Two of those have, um, have, you know, grandchildren and I miss them so much. And especially during the pandemic, right, right now, that would be, um, I would buy a, a family compound so that everyone can either live there if they're on hard times or there's plenty of, Plenty of room for them to come visit and um, also for my friends who visit New Mexico on occasion. <laughs> hey, can they come stay at your compound? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Holly, what would you what would you buy or where would you go? I'm not gonna tell anybody because if I win the lottery, you're not gonna hear from me. I'm just gonna be disappear. I would probably uh, buy a couple of places. By a place somewhere that's about 10,000 foot elevation, that's uh, near some place where I can ski all the time in the winter, and then uh, in the summer maybe somewhere off an island that had a couple of really good golf courses. So I just kind of take my private jet and go between the two. I like I'm assuming it. my lottery was big enough where I could hit a jet too. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I I want a place in the mountains and a place in either the desert or on the beach. So. Mm. Uh, Josephine. So I would say exactly where I'm at at my zoo, but I would finally build a house there and I would hire a personal chef to live in that house with me. Yes. Personal chef would be amazing. I think actually when we were talking about this webinar in our little YP group, I think one of us said that it may have been me. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Someone to come and cook for me all the time. Um, that would be great. And and Sonia, I'm going to ask you too. What would you uh, what would you buy or where would you go? I'm putting her on the spot. Putting me on the spot, on the spot. But um, if you ask, I would like to travel though. Um, I haven't been to a lot of places that it's in my bucket list. Um, that comes to my mind is like some somewhere around the beach. Just take a relaxing vacation. I like it. Okay, so with that, um, we are a couple of minutes past one o'clock. Sorry, Holly, I know you have a call, but I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our amazing panelists. Y'all were wonderful. This was fun because of so many reasons. Um, and I'm sure that they are always willing to uh, share more information, more advice with y'all if you do want to reach out to them. Um, and from your Texas YP group, thank you for being on this call and we hope that you learned something and enjoy getting to know our panelists more. So have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank y'all.